message three it's a magic number three is a magic number and the reason why i've called the message this is because uh, on the 20th of september 1998 there was something very special that happened in the nation of ireland does anyone know what happened on the 20th of september in 1998 well if you don't know let me tell you it was on that day that ireland went from having Three TV stations to four. That's right. It only took us 100 years to get from having three. In fact, up until 1996 when TG Carr was launched, which most people don't know what to do with TG Carr because uh, it's all in Irish. But up until 1996, as, as Irish people, we only had two TV stations. They were, of course, RTE. Come on. And RTE, as it was known back in the day, Network 2. And they were both state-owned, as was uh, TG Carr state-funded. But on the 20th of September, 1998, the first non-government-owned commercial TV station launched in Ireland. And because we had one and two and four, can you guess the name? TV3, that's right. TV3 launched on the uh, 20th of September. And I can remember being a, a young person, and uh, before the actual TV like, started showing programs, the, the, on the third channel, they had this video. It's recurring, like almost like our 10 to before service. And the theme song was three. It's a magic number. You know that song? Uh, yes, it is. And it have all these cool different things floating around. And I would watch this thing like for like an hour, like just, just this loop of the song and all these different things, thinking, man, like what, what's going to be on this station? Like think of the possibilities, all the cartoons. I mean, think about when something, there's nothing to watch in one and two and four. We now have a three. Like it was, it was blowing my mind you know if you're sitting here you're thinking what are you talking about like what how, why were you so excited with the launch of a tv channel i mean you probably grew up in the world of amazon prime and netflix and uh disney plus and uh youtube alone has so much to watch never mind the skybox but i come from an era when your the the, the enjoyment of your television watching was determined by this demonic apparatus See if you can relate to this, everybody. Does anyone know what this awful thing is? We call them bunny ears, right? And if you're wondering, what is this ghoulish thing? This was the key to having a happy family up until the year 2000. Because if this thing wasn't working, what you got was this. And this was no one's friend. How do you remember static, everybody? Now, the way it worked in most homes was there was a hierarchy. So usually uh, people would have their go at trying to adjust, like a family. Like, think about how close families were before the internet. Like we would take turns at trying to adjust the bunny ears to get a clear signal. And typically speaking, every family had that one person whose job it was when they found the channel, don't move. Don't you dare move. So some person, every family was sacrificed for the well-being of the rest of the family so that we could watch television and it was so frustrating wasn't it and and the worst part was you'd be watching a movie or a match and it'd be that key moment and all of a sudden everything's going well and then that white line would appear remember that white line and it would appear and then it would go up and down the screen you, and you knew what was coming static was going to find you and you'd lose your mind thinking it was working why isn't that working and you'd be trying to do all sorts of mathematical equations so comes to the earth airwaves air temperature 
turning the bunny ears, putting tinfoil on them. Of course, everyone had a theory about something they heard or saw. There wasn't Google back then, so you, missed, you read stuff in, in Britannicas, everybody. Come on, I'm showing my age now. And, uh, and, and that was life. Unless, of course, you were, you know, a little bit better off, had more moolah, more arrogate than most. Well, if you or someone had wealth back there, you didn't have bunny ears. No, no. You had a cable TV box, everybody. You had a box that digital numbers, we call it a digibox when we were growing up. And I can remember going to my friend's house, and two things fascinated me. One, there was no need for bunny ears. It just worked. It was amazing. And two, there was ten channels. Ten. There was like RT1, RT2, TV3, TG Car, BBC1, BBC2, BBC Northern Ireland, and then the most cataclysmic, most important event of my entire life happened, the launching of the Cartoon Network, everybody. I mean, come on. You know what it's like to grow up in Ireland in the rain and have no television? Not fun. And the point is, TV3 changed the face of Ireland forever. Three is a magic number. But it was years later when I was in college studying counselling. And I was studying how we as human beings, even though we're one person, we're made up into three parts. We have a body, we have a soul, and we have a spirit. It was when I was thinking about this idea of how each part of us has a purpose and how each part of us has different needs that I began to realize, wow, three really is a magic number. Now, as we think about mental health and mental, mental wellness, mental health is defined as a state of well-being in which every individual realizes his or her own potential, or as we say in Lighthouse terms, their extraordinary purpose, uh, can cope with the normal stresses of life, can work productively and fruitfully, and is able to make a contribution to his or her community. Isn't that a great definition of mental health? Someone's really happy, thank you. So um, it's a great definition of mental health. Now, what is mental ill health then? I mean, to be unwell, to be ill, is the opposite of this. It's where we're not able to function, not able to cope, not able to contribute, not able to walk out and experience our extraordinary purpose, and not able to live life to the full potential to which life has given us. And when it comes to ill health, there's two sides to ill health. There's the internal side, and there's the external side. Now, a brief note on the internal side. The internal side is something that's beyond my ability to, to help you with, because there are genuine cases where people have chemical or psychological issues that require professional help. There are people, I've had many friends over the years, that have had just different uh, imbalances with how uh, different enzymes in their brain were working and hormones. Of, and they literally needed supplements and help to chemically be balanced to their physiology so that they could be mentally well. There's other people I know, of course, many years being a pastor, who went through trauma or have genuine psychological challenges and need professional help. And I want to encourage you that if you find yourself today in a place where you're feeling hopeless and helpless and lost, we come talk to us, talk to our Next Steps team, talk to myself, we'd love to help you. But all that we can do is encourage and counsel you. We can't, we, we're not the solution. We've got to thank God for the professions that are out there to help us and thank God for the technologies and the medicines that are available to help us be well. But we must seek help. What I can speak to, however, is the external side of things. Because uh, where we can't really control at times the internal things, we can actually control to a large extent the external side of being ment mentally unwell. And usually there's two key determining factors that help shape and determine our mental wellness uh, as it comes to mental health. The first one is, of course, environment. And environment refers to the places we surround ourselves with. The second is relationships the people we surround ourselves with. Nothing has uh, a more powerful effect in shaping you as a person, shaping your life, shaping the trajectory of your life, shaping your well-being than the places you put yourself in and the people you surround yourself with. Literally, if you want to do a, a snakes and ladders and just skip down to the end of the message and go to sleep right now, this is the bottom line. Pay attention to the places and the people you surround yourself with. Because they are shaping your, not just the direction of your life, but the quality of, of your life, and to some degree, the outcome of your life. Which is why we as a church, we're so passionate about creating environments that are welcoming, that are hopeful, that are encouraging, that are inspiring. We want every single person, 
What are they believe in Jesus, like Jesus, or want Jesus to feel welcome in our church? That they did it. Nobody's perfect. Everybody's welcome. And because God is and God does, anything is possible. So we want to create environments that, that help you in that regard. But we also, this is why we're so passionate about people being in groups. And you're going to hear more about connect groups later. But this is why we're also so passionate about people being in groups. Why? Because who you surround yourself, a good friend of mine said, who you're, who you're running with is where you're running to. Who you surround yourself with ultimately is shaping the direction and the outcome of life. And we want people to have real, genuine, lasting, fruitful friendships that aren't just convenience-driven or transactional, but actually are transformational, that help us to live out our extraordinary purpose. So, in order for us then to be healthy and to have relationships that are the same, we need to be healthy in three main ways. And to help us understand what that looks like, what it means, we're going to turn to God's Word, and we're going to turn specifically to a, a letter in the New Testament called the Book of First Thessalonians. Now, if you uh, have the Bible app, a U version, all today's notes are there for you. If you don't have the Bible app, just go to the Apple Store, App Store, and uh, search Bible app, a U version. Click on more, click on events, and all today's notes are there for you. But the reason why there's a book of First Thessalonians is because there's a book of Second Thessalonians. Thank you. And uh, a Thessalonian. Thessalonian is an adjective that's used to describe a person who's from an ancient Greek city called Thessalonica. Nica. Now, this city still exists in modern-day Greece, way up northern Greece, near the Turkish border. In modern-day vernacular, it's called Thessaloniki, but back in the day, it was called Thessalonica. And the Apostle Paul had been to the city, had shared the good news, people opened their heart to Jesus, a church was formed, and now he's moved on, but he's writing to this church and encouraging them about the importance of being connected, the importance of having hope, the importance of persevering, the importance of being, of trusting in God's faithfulness. So he writes this letter to the church, the people at uh, Thessalonica. And in chapter 5, in verse 23, he's closing off the letter and he's doing something we all do without even thinking. That is, whenever we finish off, finish off an email, a text message, or a phone call, we always have like a, a formal ending to our content. Now, what we do in our world is, depending on where someone lies in the social hierarchy of intimacy with us, we use different expressions. For example, if you're dealing with someone in a work sense, usually you'll say, kind regards, sincerely yours, or so on and so forth. If it's someone that's still not friend, but not strictly business, you might say all the best. But to a mate, a friend, or a pal, you'll say cheers, you'll say uh, chaka, you'll say thumbs up, whatever, you've all sorts of different things. And to the most intimate of relationships, you'll say, I love you, or love, or, or just a red heart, or maybe three red hearts, or whatever you're into. What's really awkward is when you send the love heart, or I love you, to the boss at work. That's very strange, you know what I'm saying? So we know the difference of getting these bits up. So, so the Apostle Paul is closing off his letter, and because he feels so much love and, 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 and values the people so highly, he wants to finish his letter with a, with a blessing. Uh, theologically speaking, we call it a benediction. And it's a beautiful blessing that he said, hey, this is what I want for you. And I think echoed in Paul's sentiment, echoed in his feeling, is a feeling that God wants for us, that God wants this for us. And in verse 23, we'll read what it is. It says this, May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful and he will do it. Now, a couple of key terms. The first one is the word peace. He's the God of peace. We're going to break down in a second. The second key term is this, this interesting word, sanctify. And uh, ultimately, Paul is saying, you can see there, spirit, soul, and body, there's the three. And at the end of the day, kind of undergirding this, 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 this prayer, this blessing, this, this, this sentiment is, you know, God is faithful, and God is able, and God will do it. So the word peace, the Apostle Paul uses here, is the word erinae. Now, I don't know about you, and how you feel about school or college, but perhaps the most useless thing I ever learned my entire life was a language that no longer exists. Part of my theological training required I learned New Testament Greek. New Testament Greek is not the Greek to speak today. In fact, no one speaks it. It's literally a dead language. It's good for one thing, and that is using Greek words in sermons. So 
The Greek word here for peace is the word erine. And what's happening here is, is in the use of this word, because again, the New Testament was written in Greek, that's why. Um, the Apostle Paul is, is throwing back to another word that was used in the Old Testament. The Old Testament was written in Hebrew, and it's a very powerful word. You've probably heard this word in the past, seen it, or maybe you're familiar with it. It's the word shalom. And in Jewish culture, oftentimes when, when priests or people would bless each other, they'd bless each other with shalom. And that word, loosely speaking, is, can be defined as peace, but actually at its core, what it literally means is, may the wholeness of God make you well and make you whole. May God complete in you that which lacks so that you may be complete. It's like, it's just so powerful. It's just bigger than, hey, may a peace of God be with you. I hope you have peace. Have a nice day. Have a peace day. It's like, listen, may the wholeness of God fill you and make you whole. So this word is kind of shadowing that same idea in the Greek. And what it's speaking to is that Paul is saying the God of peace is a God of security. He's a God of safety. He's a God of satisfaction. What he's saying is, these are the things that we long for and look for in life. These are the things we long for in healthy relationships. We want to know that we're, we're secure, that we don't have to wonder will that person betray us or use us or, or deceive us. We're secure in our trust in that person. We want to also know that we're safe. That this person, that we're, whether it's a friend or an employer, church, spouse, we want to have confidence that they're looking out for our best interests. And ultimately what we want is we want a relationship that is mutually satisfying and helps us to live out our potential. Now Paul is saying, you know, obviously echoing that this is, these are things that we desire, but ultimately these things can only come from, in, in their fundamental sense, a relationship with God. Why? Because he is the source of ultimate security, eternal safety, and he is the only person that can truly satisfy our soul. This is who God is. This is what God offers the world. Now, the next key word is the word sanctify. And the word sanctify in the Greek is the word hagiadzo. Hagiadzo. And this is an interesting word. Why? Because to sanctify, in a sense, means to make something clean. It also has connotations or a connection to the word holy. And if you're like me and you grew up in a traditional church, I grew up as a Roman Catholic and I was an altar boy and you know, everything was holy. I mean, the garments we wore were holy. The altar was holy. I mean, I grew up driving by buildings. My parents would bless themselves, drive by a church, drive by a graveyard, drive by their, you know, GEA grounds, bless themselves. Like, holy, holy, holy. And again, I didn't really understand what, what does holy mean? What, what, what is, in essence, holiness? And, and, and if I try to break it down in a very simple way, holiness literally means separate. Separate as in this is special. Kind of like how at home, there's certain things that are available to everybody in the house, but certain things are special. Whether it's, you know, Delph, China, ornament, special bottle of wine, special bo bottle of whiskey, where there's a certain control, like the, the surround sound system. The kids can watch TV and use the TV control, but the surround sound system, you know, that's holy. That goes in a special place up high. Maybe it's that box of chocolates you don't want your toddler to know about. Like whatever it is, we get the idea of not, not everything has the same and equal value in the economy of scale. And therefore, if something is special or sacred, it's put in a different place. And ultimately, that's what God is. God is holy. He's separate to us, separate to our world. He's involved because he loves us, but he is so above everything because he's so sacred. And what Paul is saying is that the God, in his, the God of peace, God in his security, safety, and satisfaction wants to work in us in a way that cleanses us and separates us from all the things that pull us down and try to destroy us. In essence, what Paul is saying is God wants to make us new. God wants to make us new. Now, as we move on then, a reference to body, soul, spirit. It was Joyce Meyer who said, I used this quote last week. She said, you see, you are a spirit, you have a soul, and you live in a body. You have emotions, you have thoughts, and you have will, and you have a conscience. You are a complex being, and Jesus came to heal every single part of you. There's not one part that he doesn't want to make completely whole. So what does it mean in this first message as a lay foundation for the whole series to be, to be mentally well, to be mentally whole, and to have relationships that are the same? Well, what it means is this. We have to recognize that who we are is what we bring into the relationships that we're part of. And the first step to making the relationships that matter to us well is to take responsibility for the well-being of ourselves. And to do that, 
we must recognize the first thing Meyer points out, or sorry, the third thing he points out, we work backwards, which is you live in a body. You live in a body, and your body has purpose. It was the Apostle Paul who wrote a letter to the uh, Corinthians. Again, it's a city in southern Greece, a city called Corinth, and Paul wrote the first letter because there's a second letter. And uh, I actually had the, the privilege of being there just before Christmas last year, getting to explore the ancient city and see all these different archaeological things which help verify the historicity of Paul's writing, uh, an amazing city. But Paul wrote to this church city, Corinth, he said in verse 19, Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit, who is in you, whom you have received from God? Time out. So Paul is saying here to the Corinthian churches, when you put your faith in Jesus, when you decide, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to trust Jesus, I'm going to give him my life, I'm going to ultimately decide that, that, that what he said about himself is true, what the words is true, I'm going to trust him. What happens in that moment is God does a redemptive, renewing work within us, which transforms us inside to out, but also he puts his spirit in us. And so this run-down, derelict shack of a body, extra large shack if you're in my, uh, my shoes, uh, all of a sudden goes from being like no one wants to buy it, pass its sell by date, possibly fit for destruction, to now having the most important person in the universe living in it. And it may not be of valuable value to the world, it may not even be of much value to you, but Paul says, you are not your own, for you are bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. Your body is sacred. I don't know if anyone's ever told you this, or maybe they haven't said it in a long time, but I'll tell you right now, you have a body to die for. Now, I ain't dying for your body, and probably those around you ain't going to die for your body. But the good news is, somebody already did. When Jesus gave his body on the cross, he gave his body in exchange for ours. Yes, he wants to save our soul. Yes, he wants to save our spirit. But he died. He, but he literally purchased this shack of a being and wants to use it for extraordinary purpose. Your body has a divine plan. Your body has divine purpose. Now, the question is, well, what, what does one do in response to that? Like, what, what, okay, so you're telling me my body isn't just a lump of flesh that's one day going to become worm food? No. Your body has divine purpose now. So what should we do in response to what well, Paul says? We should honor God with our bodies. What does it look like to honor God with our bodies? There's three main ways. Number one, we honor God in purity, we honor God in purpose, and we honor God in prosperity. And i explain these and break them down. First of all, we honor God with purity. If you read 1 Corinthians 6 in its entirety, in its context, what you'll discover is the subject matter that Paul was actually dealing with was the subject matter of sexual immorality. The idea that people were taking this body that God had bought back from sin, by virtue of did in the cross, and using it in a way that wasn't honoring to God's plans and purposes. Understand, there's nothing wrong with sex. In fact, sex was God's idea. God created our body with divine purpose, but then he also gave us the gift of allowing our body to experience someone else's body, and that's where the magic really happens. And if you're not careful, two become three, and three is a magic number. I won't go into that whole conversation. The point is, there's nothing wrong with having sex. You should have as much sex as is humanly possible for as long as your body lasts to get the full enjoyment out of life. But, but, God's plan and purpose is that that amazing gift, which is like a wildfire, should exist in the context of two people committed to each other in a heterosexual, monogamous relationship. Again, that may not be everyone's piece of cake, but that is God's design and God's plan. That is the best way for a gift to be enjoyed. It can be used. It can be abused. It was in the Corinthian church. This wasn't Paul speaking of people out of the church. Paul was addressing people in the church who were doing this. And you can do that, but ultimately, if you want to honor God, honor God by living in your body in a way that is pure. Not, not like sacrosanct, perfect. But as much as possible, as, as, as you're able, live in a way that, a lot, that your body is aligned to the plans and purpose of God. Now, the second thing then is, can I connect to this? And that is the idea, the idea that your body has a purpose. Like, you, like God wants to work in you and work through you in the world. Like he, he wants to make the world that you live in a better place. That the idea of the kingdom is in you, it should flow through you 
into the place you live, the place you work, the place you study, wherever your friends are. God wants to use your body, work through your body in a way that makes the world a better place. And the prosperity part refers to the idea that God is glorified when we are well. Now, God is also glorified when we are not well, but ultimately speaking, when we are living at the full potential of our body, that glorifies God, which is why I love the story of uh, Eric Liddell. So remember that old movie, Chariots of... Uh, Fire in that movie, and uh, it's a true story of a, of a Scottish Olympian who uh, ran and broke all his records. And when someone asked him, Eric, why do you run? He said, because when I run, I feel the pleasure of God. There's something about when we, when we, when we use our body to the fullest of its potential, it's like we're, we're, we are doing the thing that we're created to do. Now, of course, there's times and seasons where we can't control illness or disease or accidents and again, you know, in those moments, we trust God and His grace and mercy. But I want to talk about the things that we can control, the things that we are responsible for. For example, we can control what we eat, and we can control how much we sleep. Now, I'm not going to give you a nutritional lesson right now, but I will say this. It's scientific fact that the better we eat and the better we sleep, the more energy we have, the less stress we have, and generally speaking, the better our mood is. Which, come on, let's be honest for just a moment. Oftentimes, the greatest crisis sees in our lives, our meltdown moments, the things that we end up regretting and having to apologize for, aren't spiritual crises, are they? And sometimes they're not even truly emotional ones. They may be emotional in nature, but they're emotional because we didn't take care of our body. We were tired. We're not eating well. Maybe we're hungry. We're hangry. And therefore, those key relations around us end up suffering with the, with the uh, end result of a tyrant-style mood. And we can pray to God, we can cry out loud, we can do all the things, but ultimately, God just says, shut up and go to sleep. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, get up in the morning, have some wee bits and go for a run. Like, not all things are super spiritual. Sometimes the most spiritual thing you can do is go to sleep. I love the story of Elijah in the Old Testament when uh, he was having an emotional meltdown, and he's like, God, you know, everything's going wrong, and I want to die, and he's really going through a tough time. <clears throat> and God literally puts him asleep. And then when he woke up, God made a barbecue for him, which, by the way, if you're a vegan, it was steak. So I don't know what a vegan barbecue looks like, maybe beetroot or something, I don't know. What but God provided steak. And just by sleeping and eating, God ministered to Elijah. God cares about our body. It was Henry Ward Beecher, the 19th century speaker, uh, who said, God made the human body and it is the most exquisite and wonderful organization, I love that word, which has come to us from the divine hand. Your body is an amazing piece of kiss. And even though our bodies are fallen, and even though our bodies are imperfect, and even though our bodies eventually will fail us, still your broken body, which is made by God, is more impressive and more powerful than anything any human being can make. Your body is an amazing thing. Secondly, you have a soul. You live in a body and you have a soul. In the book of 3 John chapter 1, and the reason why it's called 3 John is because there's a 1 John and there's a 2 John. Before there was a 1 John, there's a Gospel of John. So John the Apostle wrote the Gospel of John. He wrote 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, and he also wrote the book of Revelation. So John's quite a favorite when it comes to the New Testament. And in 3 John, writing to a church nearby, he says, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. So kind of like Paul's benediction at the end of his letter, uh, John in his greeting brings a benediction. says, I want, I want things, that word prosper means to go well. I want things to go well with you in all things just as you internally. So almost like John is saying, you know, as you go well inside... What's happening inside affects what happens outside. That word soul in the Greek is the word suke, where we get the English word psyche. And literally how it's defined is, it's the seat or source or, or a center of our feelings, our desires, our affections, and our aversions. Uh, in other words, our soul is the place where we, we think, where we decide, and where we express. To put it in other words, our souls are comprised of a mind, a will, and an emotion. Mind was so, so, so we're tripart beings, body, soul, and spirit, but also our soul has three parts. And, and it's so interesting because it's, it's like, it's like when you're going to bake a cake. Like you have flour and you have sugar, and I'm talking about things I don't understand because I've never baked before, but you have all these ingredients and you bring them all together, you put them in an oven, and all of a sudden, here's a cake. Now, if I were to say to you, can you extract 
the flour and the sugar out of man. It's like, well, how does one do that? It's like, it's, it's now a thing. In the same way, you know, we see the ingredients, but our soul is this, is this marriage of these three things, our mind, our will, and our emotion. And I'm just not going to be able to explain this eloquently enough, so let me divert to C.S. Lewis, who can. He said this way, as image and apprehension are in essence an organic unity. So pause. What he's saying is, just like our ability to see and understand, so we see a thing, we understand a thing. You're looking at me right now, and by the gestures that I'm making my body, by the sounds that are coming out of my mouth, through language, through history, through emotions, through all the things your brain is doing right now. Like right now, you're hearing me talk to you, you're talking to yourself about what I'm saying to you, and you're having a conversation with that conversation. There's three conversations going on in your head right now. No wonder we need help. And what's amazing is we are not conscious of the fact that our brain, like a supercomputer, is seeing things all the time and understanding and comprehending and simplifying so that we can take one action step. So Lewis makes the observation that just like image and apprehension are an organic unity, so for the Christian are human body and human soul. Now, with that being true, there's three main battlegrounds that we have to face and confront if we're going to be whole and well in the soul. The first one is the battlefield for the mind. It's a battle of thinking. Like I said, we're not aware sometimes of our thinking. And sometimes in our thinking, we're not thinking. For example, did you ever find yourself arriving in a place wondering, how did I get here? Maybe you're here right now thinking, how did I get here? Or did you ever think about, like for example, think about your morning routine this morning. Do you remember putting your socks on? Good for you. Maybe you had a struggle. That's why it's like, yeah, I remember the struggle. Uh, do you ever brush your teeth? Like some things become so robotic. It's like we're doing these actions, but like our brain essentially realizes that this repetitive action has no use energetically speaking. So our brain shuts off our conscious, conscious mind and allows us to drift into like sleep mode. Like we are like literally in sleep mode. Like our subconscious is fired with like, the dog, the vet, the NCT, don't forget the dinner, the mother-in-law. Like, but our conscious mind is like, just go to sleep. Boop. Like right now, some of you are asleep right now. Wake up, come back. Um, and the challenge of this is, is that sometimes we're not thinking about what we're thinking. And what we're thinking is thinking. It's thinking, thinking. It's bad stuff. We're thinking negative things, unhelpful things, perhaps even hurtful things. And we don't realize that as the old scripture used to say in the New King James, as a man thinketh in his heart, so he is. Like, what, what, how we think shapes who we are. And so we need to become conscious of what we're thinking. We need to allow the work of the Spirit, the work of God's Word, to, to, to shape our thinking for the better. That the Bible says, scripture says in, in, the, in the book of Philippians, another letter that Paul wrote to the church in Philippi, which is modern day uh, Turkey, he said, he said, uh, he said, we should think about noble things. We should think about wonderful things. We should be consciously putting our mind on things that are helpful and hopeful because these things shape us. The second battlefield is the battlefield of the will. This is a battle for direction. So we all know willpower, the, will, the, the, the power to choose, the power to decide, the power ultimately to take our desires and to make adjustments with our body, with our life, and then move in that direction. And there's always a, a, a competition of wills when it comes to our will versus God's will. And Jesus best demonstrated this, didn't he, when he said, Lord, not my will, but your will be done. Last week we showed a video of Bono, remember that? And Gay Byrne asked Bono in the interview, do you pray? And Bono said, I do. And Gay said, well, what do you pray for? Great question. And Bono said, I pray for God's will. Why? Because rather than asking God to come bless my will, his will is already blessed. So if I understand his will and walk in his will and, and my direction is his direction, then I'm already blessed. And ultimately, the will of God for us is this, that we would live, that we would love, and that we experience life and life to the full. What happens oftentimes is life itself offers us a cheap counterfeit which leads us down a path that is destructive and also leads to selfishness and sometimes leads to the loss of key relationships. One of the best prayers that we can pray as we're thinking about God's plan and purpose is, God, what is your will for my life? Because usually, when our life is aligned to God's plan, 
That's where we can live most fulfilled and most blessed. Third battle is the battle of emotion. And it's the battle for feeling. And here's the thing, even the coldest, most emotionally detached person in this room feels. We may not be good at expressing feeling, emotion, but we have it. I'm a person who, I have one gear, everybody. The one emotion I'm really good at expressing is anger. I mean, that thing just gets out, oh, I'm not trying to bring it, get it back in the pot, come on. You know, it just spills everywhere. It's like, oh, not again. But all the other emotions, I'm just not able to express as well. But just because I can't express them, doesn't mean I'm not feeling or experiencing them. Every single one of us is an emotional, sentient, sentimental being. We have feelings. And those feelings, if we're not careful, actually have a powerful motivational effect on our lives. What we think is thinking, driving our direction, is actually feeling. And if you allow the direction of your life to be turned by feelings, you're going to end up in a very unhelpful and unhappy place. So every day, just by living, just even in the, in the three or four minutes it takes to brush our teeth, there's a battle on for our thinking, for our direction, and for our feeling. This is why we need help. This is why we need friends. This is why in our church, we need a group. You know, we, every one of us should, should have a group of people that are, again, please understand, the purpose of a group is not the group. The group is the tool. The purpose of the group is to have friends to have the crack, to share life, to have people that you can count on, to have people that you can be real with. Why? Because most of our relationships, let's be honest, are transactional. They're all about what I can get out of you as you get out of me. And as long as we're both getting something out of this thing, we're both happy. But if if all of a sudden you get more of me than I get out of you, then we're no longer friends. But true relationship in its essence asks a different question. How can I give of me to you? so you can be better. And if you then reciprocate that, then imagine the magic that can happen in those kinds of relationships. That is, of course, the premise for every healthy relationship, including marriage, but also for friendship. And I don't care, like, if it's, like, this is us, we're recording Easter, we're just messing here. I used to be in a rock band, guys, once once upon a time. I was a drummer in a heavy metal band. Just saying, maybe one day we'll bring it back in worship. Um, Anyway, the point is, the feeling of being in a tight-knit band, the feeling of being in a winning team, the feeling of being at work and working with a team that's aligned and winning, that feeling is something that's, that, that echoes deep in our soul in a more fundamental way that we need lifelong lasting friendships that help us to do this thing well, to help us in the battle of thinking, direction, and feeling. And I want to encourage you, if you have, why not consider joining the group so you can experience that friendship. So we live in a body, we have a soul, and number three, you are a spirit. There you go. You are a spirit. I don't mean Casper the ghost kind of spirit, guys. But I mean something much more powerful than that. It's in the book of Genesis, chapter 2, verse 7. Genesis in Hebrew means beginnings. Very first book of the Bible. It says, And the Lord God formed man, that's mankind, of the dust of the ground. And he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living thing. Now, what's interesting is, here God formed man, so he had the flesh, the body, and in the body, is the, is the, uh, the mind is there, and, and DNA, so there's, there's the, 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 the apparatuses of, of the soul are there, but until the spirit is put in the body, the person is not a living thing. In the same way, when our day comes, even though our body still exists, even though our brain and all the different parts of us that make up the soul, the things that are deep into the core of being are there. Ultimately, when the breath of life leaves us, we're dead. Now, that word breathed is actually a a very powerful Hebrew word. It's the word ruach. And literally what it means is spirit. When God basically imparted to us his spirit, we became or we become a living thing. Our spirit is the part of us that is eternal. Our spirit is the part of us that existed before our body and will exist after our body. Our spirit is that, that thing that's deep within us that no matter how materialistic we become, we just know deep down in our spirit, beyond our soul. We feel our soul, but we know it in our spirit that this life is not the only life. This life is preparation for something greater. It was a great uh, thinker and philosopher, Pierre uh, Telrand de Chardin, who said, We are not human beings having a spiritual experience. We are spiritual beings having a human experience. 
Now what happens is, if you go back to the beginning, the book of beginning, Genesis, God creates Adam and Eve. He gives them the gift of life, perfect body, perfect soul, and the Spirit of God, and they live in the presence of God. But it wasn't enough. They made a choice to go beyond the boundaries of the relationship that God set out and to do something for themselves that ultimately we call sin. Sin is simply anything that is done outside the boundaries of God's best advice that harms us or harms others. That's what sin is, in essence. And what sin always does is sin brings separation. If I offend you, it creates a gap. If I betray you, it creates a gap. If I harm you, it creates a gap. Depending on how bad my action is, that gap could be a small gap, that gap could be a large gap, or for some people that gap is an irreconcilable gap. We can never, the nature of what you've done to me means I can never, ever, ever fully reconcile with you. And it's amazing to me why, because perhaps the, the worst of all human consequences is separation. Like think about it, if the reward promised to us in Scripture is that one day we will live in unity with God for all of eternity, then the opposite, some people call it hell, is to live in a permanent disunity and separation from God. Hell, in essence, is living in a world void of God. What is God? God is good. And God is love, and God is peace, and God is kind. God created taste, and smell, and touch. God created sex, everybody. I mean, come on, God created music. Like, to live in an existence without those things, that is hell. And that is not a place God sends you, but it's a place God because place people choose when they reject God's plan and purpose for their life. Ultimately, it's eternal separation. It's the worst of all consequences. Now, I was trying to think of a really brilliant theological way to explain this and, and, and to bring this out more, and I couldn't, so I diverted to Super Nanny. Um, because Super Nanny is actually a, a very wise woman. And I learned this personally in how I, as a parent, interface with my kids. Because up until Super Nanny came out in 2005, in Ireland, we only had two gears as parents. Two things we could do. We would scream at our kids with explicitives, all sorts of words, uh, or we would whack them. That was it. And usually one led to the other. And so in Ireland, pre-2005, we didn't have any more tools. That was it. We would shout at our kids and scream nasty things, come over for a little beep, 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 or whack, or both as was happening. And then Super Nanny comes along and is like, listen, there's other options. It's like, oh my goodness, we can do other things. And of course, I don't know if it originated with her, but the big thing that we took away as young parents from Super Nanny was the idea of the time out strategy. Come on, somebody. Or the step. And so we learn as parents that we can uh, take away privileges and we can, um, you know, ground. And sometimes, sometimes you have to smack and we can do all these things. And, and really, uh, you know, four kids and... 17 years later, you need to use all the tools available in the toolbox, I tell you. But essentially, nothing was more powerful than time out. Why? Because there's something in the human spirit that knows to be separated is not healthy. To be isolated is not good. And those moments, and of course, we were taught uh, one minute for every year of age. Not everyone agrees with that, but anyway, I don't care. It worked for me. And, uh, and so that's what we do. And there was something powerful about giving the child some time to think about their actions, think about their behavior, think about what happened. Then as a good parent, you come out, and of course, Super Nanny, you kneel down, eye level, you're powering up and stuff, and you're calm, and all these things, and when you say like, you know, so what, you know, what did you do, and, and do you realize it, and are you sorry? And, and it's always this beautiful moment where after the quote-unquote sin, after the trespass, after the thing that caused the separation is admitted to and owned, then there's redemption, then there's restoration, then there's reconciliation. And it's that beautiful moment as parents that we all get to, to live in for a moment where we hug our child. And they hug us in a way that is so special. Like you can feel their, their genuine grief for the harm they've caused. And somehow over time, when you don't kill your kids, things get better. Things can only get better. I sing a song myself every day of the week. It's only a season. Here's the bottom line. Separation requires redemption. Our body, our soul, and our spirit was separated from God when mankind chose to live outside the boundaries of God's wisdom for our relationship with Him. And so because that, someone had to pay the price for that consequence, 
Someone had to take the time out for us. Someone had to sit in the step. Someone had to give up their body, their soul, and their spirit so ours could be redeemed. And that's what Jesus Christ did on the cross. He paid the price. He paid the consequence. He satisfied the demand so that we who are far can be brought near. And salvation, in essence, is the idea that God redeems our spirit. To redeem means you buy back. It's like, you know, um, imagine, you know, like I remember being in school and sometimes teachers say, okay, if, if you have your phone out, I'm going to confiscate your phone. And sometimes in our school, you need to buy back your phone. I think that was a very clever system. It was a very mean system, but a very clever system. Because not only was your property confiscated, but it wasn't enough just to wait for the end of the class. You had to buy back your phone. You had to redeem it because the, the, the trespass demanded payment. And so what God did in sending Jesus is God sent his son to pay the price for our sins so our spirit could be redeemed. And so I think, well, isn't that it? No. God also restores our soul. To restore something means to put it back to its original mode. This idea that something was distorted or broken inside of us, something's off with our mind or will and our emotions, something, something's not aligned, something is not, is, not, is not functioning or firing the way it should. And part of the supernatural work of God is God restores our soul. I think, oh, wonderful. So our spirit and our soul will one day fly up to heaven like an angel playing the harp. No, because God also reconciles our body. Jesus died for our spirit, our soul, and our body. Now, in essence, we call this the gospel, the good news, that Jesus came to save us. Literally, this idea that we as spiritual beings were dead because of our sin. That's why you probably have the term born again. What Jesus did for us, he gave us the ability, like we celebrated last week in baptism, to be born, be made alive again for all eternity. This is how, in essence, we are made well. This is how, in essence, we are made whole. This is, in essence, the gospel. But the question I want to ask as we close then is, how do we stay well? It is a gift that we experience. It's what God has already done for us. Great. But where, where, where are the handles? What can I do to live in this reality? We stay well when, number one, we pray in the Spirit. You cannot live in intimacy or proximity with people when you don't communicate with them. Again, I've been married 19 years, I think. Too long to remember. A long time. Thank you for that one clap. Uh, my wife deserves a clap, not me. I'm the problem. Okay? She deserves all the, all the, all the uh, applause. I've been married a long time. And no matter how, I mean, I've, I've been married so long that I've lived longer with my wife than I ever lived without her. Does that make sense? So we've been together longer than we were apart. It's bizarre. So when I think about myself and my wife, I think of us as a thing. Not as two separate beings, as a thing. That's who we are. It still amazes me after 19 years how it's still important for me to communicate. Like, you would think that just looks and, and you know. And again, we can do a lot of that, but it's amazing when you live with someone for a long time how much nonverbal communication you actually can achieve. It's, it's amazing. But still, my wife needs me to communicate. Still, I need her. You know, why? Because you can't have a relationship of intimacy and quality and health if you don't communicate. All prayer is is our communication with God. And understand, God doesn't need our prayer. He wants it. But we need to hear answers from heaven. Because in our thinking, thinking, and in the battle of our will, and in the battle of our feelings, we need help from heaven. Second thing we do to stay well is we read the word. Why? Because what combats the negative, selfish thinking of the world? The truth of God's word. The truth of God's word. When God's word is in us, and we are in God's word, God's word transforms us from the inside out. Understand, when I was a skeptic, I didn't believe in church, I was against church, I would think that Christians were people who went went through some weird, quasi-cultish behavior modification therapy and came out like Ned Flanders. That's the best way I can describe it. When I started following Jesus, what surprised me was I didn't do anything. I would read God's word, and to the best of my ability, which wasn't very good, I would pray, and all of a sudden, Things in me changed. And over time, what was changing within me happened to overflow out of me. And that brought change to my world and the relationships around me. When we, re- when we are in God's word and God's word is in us, it helps us in our mind, our soul, and our emotions. The third thing we can do, stay well, 
is to participate in church. Now again, I'm not asking for religious observance. Most of us are here because we got out of that kind of stuff. And if you're attending church, hoping attending church makes you somehow better, it doesn't. You're sitting in a stream, listening to some hairy Irish guy talk with the Bible. That's it, okay? Sitting here doesn't change anything. What changes everything is your willingness to hear and receive from God. Your willingness to open your heart to what the Holy Spirit is doing in this moment. And when you're willing to participate in that, all of a sudden God begins to work our lives. And fourth and finally, when we serve on a team, whether it's a team on Sunday or a team during the week, but something about that if our whole lives are just about us, surely that can't be healthy. Think about it, when our children become so selfish that all they talk about and complain about and care about is themselves. We know something's wrong with this child. This child is going to grow up to be an obnoxious, self-centered, selfish little fill in the blank. Therefore, as a good parent, I must counteract this trajectory and bring some environmental and people changes, discipline, consequences, all those things, to help shape them so they grow to be a person that people actually like and appreciate. We're so able to see it in our kids, but we're so blind to see it in ourselves. Because as adults, what do we think about? Ourselves. What are we consumed with? Ourselves. Something about serving forces us to focus on other people. Right now, there's a whole team of people that did all this for you. And it's not easy, it's not comfortable, it's not their hobby, but it's good for them. When we're praying in the Word, participating in community, and actively exercising our gifts to help other people, this is how we stay well. Then, our spirit, our soul, and our bodies will prosper. They will go well. They will be whole. To be mentally healthy and to have relationships that are the same, we need to be healthy in body, soul, and spirit. Internally, and as we are internally more and more healthy, it will overflow and affect our external world. And God has invited us in part one of this series to allow His peace, that is His security, his safety, his satisfaction to work in us to make us new, to make us whole, to make us healed. So that as we are well, those that we love and those that we interact with and those that we're connected to, that they could be well also. This is the good news. Jesus has redeemed us. He's redeemed our spirits. He's restored our soul and reconciled our body. We can be made well to the power the person of the Holy Spirit. Can you, can you?